Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 654. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 23rd, 2021. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, and we talk about the news going around in the Christian church, the secular pagan world, and the Anglican communion, and that keeps you entertained once or twice a week when you sit down and watch the program. This program is not going to be as entertaining as previous programs because the subject matter is very difficult, but you'll be engrossed as well. George, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great. I'm tired this week. I, mm-hmm. The run up to Easter, uh, online and in person services, trying to reinvent church. It's not something you do in an afternoon. <laughs> no, it's, and early spring is nap season for, for most men our age. So, yeah, I know. I'm tired. I, just the, the topics we're going to talk about uh, come with a built in spiritual oppression because, you know, oh, I can't wait to talk about, you know, uh, improprieties of the sexual nature within the Anglican communion. Ugh. So, yeah, I feel tired and down today. So keep us in your prayers. Uh, it's not easy to work a full time job, which I do. Jo- George runs a full time ministry as a priest of one of the largest churches in his diocese that's tiring and then sit down with all the news we read during the week and conduct a 45 minute show that's entertaining focused transparent and you try to understand what we're saying it's not that easy and it's unscripted even though i have show notes right over here so yeah we're tired and we're tired reporting on this type of news next week hopefully it's just good news um we posted a story this week, um, does the ACNA have a spawn problem? And that's generated a lot of reads, and uh, uh, I think we got a couple on off the topic, off the topic, off the record comments uh, from uh, some people in the leadership of the ACNA. And it's an article you can find on Anglican.inc, Inc., and it's raising questions. Is there a spawn within the ACNA, a, a bishop spawn? Well, you'd have to know who Bishop Spong was, and that's almost a generation ago now uh, in the history of the church. So before we can define, does the ACNA have a Spong problem, George, who was Bishop Spong? Jack Spong was the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Newark. He's Mm -hmm. still alive. He's still with us. He still goes on lectures. Jack Spong, as a post-Christian worldview, he describes himself as a theist. Uh, not necessarily as a uh, Trinitarian Christian. Uh, at the 1998 Lambeth Conference, he was famous for bringing his new uh, new commandments for a new church. He's called Paul. He's called the Apostle Paul, a repressed homosexual. Uh, he really was the cutting edge of uh, Protestant liberalism in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, he's way up there. He's in his 80s plus right now. He's but he's still churning out books of, uh, of uh, liberal Protestant theology. He continues sort of the, he's the last gasp of the death of God crowd right. that sort of took off in the late 50s, early 60s. But he was one of the most successful practitioners of it, meaning he had a way to take academic theology and put it into popular uh, verse. So he would, rep- he would appear on Bill Maher's uh, a comedy show, talk show, talking about theology. Um, what other Episcopal bishop would appear on national uh, net syndicated uh, chat shows but Jack Spong? So Jack Spong was the poster boy for liberalism. He was the target uh, for conservatives that, you know, this is the guy who's spreading the poison. Now, what is the, what is the Spong problem? Does the ACNA have someone who is poisoning the well by well, his uh, false teaching? Right, and so the ACNA does not have a theist in, in Jack Spong or that type of progression, but um, I think the ACNA has, a, in my mind, 
a Gen Z millennial problem. Because my what my the author of okay, yeah, you, go ahead. What the author of the piece? Neither of us wrote this. This was written by a contributor, Mark Marshall, mm-hmm. and Mark Marshall defined a spong problem, and how he defined a spong problem was a bishop who is a bit of a loose cannon, and who then sucks all the air out of the public perception. So the only bishops the ACNA will sort of have on the secular stage are Foley Beach, the Archbishop, and the Bishop of the C4SO, Todd Hunter. And so Todd Hunter, who represents a small segment, theologically speaking, of the ACNA, is sucking all the air out of the room so that other bishops views so that the perception of the ACNA as a left-leaning woke institution uh, is uh, common. Mm-hmm. That's what a Spong problem is. Spong sucked the air out of the Episcopal Church's public uh, image and he became the image and Mark Marshall's thesis is that the bishops of the ACNA are in danger of allowing one of their mem- one of their brethren to set the public image of their church. But this is the difference between, you know, back when Spong was popular in making his book tours, there were many bishops in the Episcopal Church, in the House of Bishops, who were speaking and saying, this is wrong, he is a heretic, um, he doesn't speak for us. I don't see that in the ACNA. I don't see any response saying, you know, critical race theory or wokeness is not healthy to the church. It certainly isn't something we want to promote within the church, and it is not an official teaching within the church in any way, shape, or form. I don't see any pushback to what a Bishop Hunter uh, is putting in publication. Yeah. um, You... Spong had his detractors. Bob Duncan uh, was most famously uh, a, a fierce opponent of him in the House of Bishops. Fitz Allison, uh, you, you go down the, the line of many of those bishops are now in the ACNA. Uh, mm-hmm. Some are still in the Episcopal Church. Uh, uh, Jim Stanton, the Bishop of Dallas. Mm-hmm. They had no problem pointing out and being vociferous in uh, attacking Spong's heterodoxy is failure to abide by church teaching and to promote the gospels uh right now we have a sort of form of omerta a code of silence we do have a code of silence the bishops of the ac the the uh, the omerta you don't uh rat out uh, any of your fellow made men in the house of bishops um, now this is a this is helpful because part of the problem of the Episcopal Church has been it's a free for all, sometimes. Uh, but when you have somebody going off the reservation and he's going off the reservation in a way that is causing people to say, "Hey, is this really the church I want to belong to?" Because as I see it, the my understanding of the issue is that. You know, the ACNA came together as a grand compromise between various segments, the Evangelicals, the Charismatics, the Anglo-Catholics, and within this constituency, there were differing views on a number of uh, major issues, like what happens at the Eucharist. Is this a memorial? Is this transubstantiation? Is this consubstantiation? Well, the ACNA has been able to live with a historical Anglican well, we're not going to solve that today, so let's not discuss it. A secondary issue, which is not secondary for some people, are the ordination of women. Can women be priests? Can they be deacons? Can they be bishops? And the ACNA brought together groups who uh, hold opposing views on this point and made a grand compromise that each diocese could decide and there wouldn't be no bishops who are women so that because a bishop is for a u- the universal church, not just the local Correct, church. Correct, yeah. So they made this grand compromise, and it's not sat well in, for some people. Some people have uh, complained about it, but they've been willing to live with it because it hasn't really affected them. Now you have, over the last year, the uh, sort of woke, you know, as the American culture 
gets into cancer culture and craziness and we see uh, the universities falling apart and our media falling apart, all our public institutions falling apart, uh, being infected by the uh, cult of critical race theory and uh, that's based on a, uh, you know, the Frankfurt School of uh, Marxism from the 40s. You now see a, an Episcopal, you now see an ACNA bishop making statements that critical race theory can help us be better Christians, that there's something in all of this, that, and this is causing some people to say, who've been unhappy with the women's compromise to say, what the hell with this? <laughs> If this is, you know, if, if we're going down this road, I jumped, if I jump from ship A to ship B, I got to look to see where ship C is right now. And unfortunately, there isn't a ship C, folks. You got to fix this problem. You can't go anywhere else. The, and that's the big, you know, the, the AC has been successful in remaining quiet on a lot of issues uh, because they're the only dance in town. If you want to go to a dance today and you want to hang out with other people and have a, a, a consistent liturgy, uh, a consistent orthodox uh, position on so many things, great worship, the ACNA is a great place to go. And there's no other alternatives. You know, continuing anquinism in, in America, eh, you know, I don't think they have, you know, what you're looking for. So. Being the only dance in town has helped the ACNA in many ways. I don't know, though, about a diocese like uh, uh, Christ for the sake of others. Now, there's been lots of questions. Well, there's, clearly, they're, they're the only growing diocese uh, in, in recent uh, months or years. You, you need to really pay attention to what they're doing because they're successful. And if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm looking at the statistics correctly, I think their success has become because Plano was transferred from the Diocese of Pittsburgh to the Diocese of Christ for the sake of others. And if you take a mega church from one location and put it in another diocese, it makes that diocese look really good when, in fact, without that new church, they were just as like another act of diocese. Thinking. That yeah, at M Mark Marshall's article. Uh, may have had a uh, mistake on that line because mm -hmm. he said, well, I can see that the church for the diocese C4SO is growing, but is it growing in a healthy way? In other words, he granted the argument that, well, they must be successful by pursuing woke Fruits. theology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Kevin, you're, and I did not know this because I, had, I hadn't done the dive into the statistics, but as Kevin just shared, the success comes not from planting churches that are attracting people in droves, though they are planting churches and are attracting people. Yes. The numeric growth comes from shuffling members around. Um, let's compare dioceses. The, the Diocese of the Southwest, which is essentially New Mexico and Northern Mexico, um, that's a very small diocese numerically, but it, I would claim it is could be a flagship diocese in the sense of its image because it's been planting little churches in Mexico and in New Mexico and West Texas and in the El Paso area and it is growing by another congregation another mission that's healthy growth but see if Plano decides to move it move from you know Plano move from the diocese of Dallas that uh, Pittsburgh, AMIA mm -hmm. to Pittsburgh, okay. and now it's C four S O. What's the next leadership uh, going? Where they're going to move it? Mm -hmm. uh, and will that then be the the new diocese that they move to? Will that then be the flagship? Because all, all of a sudden they've just doubled their membership. Um, you're right, Kevin. You've got to look deeply at these numbers and tell us what they mean. In the same way, you need to look deeply into the goal of critical race theory. The goal of critical race theory is not to put everything right. The goal of critical race theory is to make sure that anybody who's oppressed anybody in the past is held accountable. And that's that's not going to end pretty for any anybody anywhere. All right, George. I think we talked I, enough about Well, let yeah. me just say okay. I well I, I just want to add one or two just 
Georgisms, if you will. Sure, uh, go for it. I'm not. I'm not a theologian. I don't make any claims on that score. I've written, mm-hmm. but I have been. But I am a scholar, a his, scholar of the history of theology, and the history of the church, and the history of interpretation. And you can find the antecedents of critical race theory in a secular world, in the Marxist world. But from a Christian perspective, you can also find the antecedents of critical race theory in the theology of the Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa during the apartheid regime. Mm-hmm. It's the same theological arguments are being trotted out, except in the apartheid regime, it was the whites who were superior to the non-whites. In the critical race theory, you have that reversal of it's the, the whites of the devil. This, this is the stuff that uh, Elijah Muhammad and Louis Farrakhan talk about, of uh, whites being the ice people and, you know, the, the, the agents of the devil. And this is, the critical race theory is as much an abomination to Trinitarian Christianity as is Jack Spong's new theses for a new world. Because it teaches a false gospel. It teaches, it relies on hatred, envy, jealousy, and throws out the entire Christian message of the fellowship of man, of the individual being responsible for their sins and needing to turn to Christ and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If substituting in its place your pigmentation, your melanin, you know, how dark you are, how white, how pale you are, is uh, where you'll stand on the uh, on the uh, stairway to heaven. It's an abomination, and you can clothe it in any amount of of uh, nihilistic gobbledygook, but it is unchristian. And well, any and any bishop who allows this to be propagated and commends it is a false teacher. Mm-hmm. Now. The problem is most of these guys don't really know. They're not that well educated, and they're not that well trained. They're not schooled in what being a bishop is. A bishop is not an administrator or a presbyt or, or a chief presbyter. We're not Methodists. We're not Baptists or moderators. A bishop is a father in God who's not on a journey. He's already arrived at the faith, and he's not called to help us recreate the faith. He's called to teach the faith handed down by the disciples and you got a mistake here of somebody thinking that they know better any philosophy that does not allow for forgiveness redemption grace or mercy is a false theory and it's going to kill a lot of people um as Oh my gosh, Marxism has done over the last 120 years. I think we tally now 116 million, 120 million have died because of uh, democratic socialism or Marxism. I don't want to add to that number because we follow the false gospel of critical race theory. Okay, here's the report we've been. Who who were the. Yeah. yeah. What middle class white males are the new kulaks? The Mm -hmm. new. Uh, people who need to be exterminated for the good of all mankind. This is the logical consequence of critical race theory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you you remember that? You know, uh, Whitaker you, Chambers was. Go ahead. Whitaker Chambers was famous for reviewing Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand uh, the, uh, the sort of the doyen of uh, libertarian uh, philosophers, by saying her works had the whiff of the gas chamber around them. Critical race theory has the whiff of the gas chamber around it. Okay. The only way to solve this is by getting rid of the enemy and the devil, and the devil's identified as a certain people or group. We've done this to the Jews throughout history. Now we're doing it to somebody else. We got to stop. Now we're going to tra- transition to another story <laughs> of horrible merit as well. So we we've identified that the ACNA has a problem and we i think in my mind right now but the, the, the ACNA has the ability to fix the problem the, uh, it, it ha- Kevin. no you're true because the what we've seen now for 10 years is there is accountability within the ACNA, even at the bishop level so 
if you didn't know there's a problem, Georgia and I are telling you there's a problem. It's not just a millennial Gen Z problem, but it's a problem. Okay, so we have been waiting for the Jonathan Jonathan Fletcher report to be released. Um, George is going to give you a quick history update on who Jonathan Fletcher was. We're going to talk a little bit about the report and maybe the next steps, what to do now. Now, this is another story that we've covered in this church for 2,000 years. Popular, charismatic uh, teacher, leader creates a cult, a little cult following. And in that cult, uh, you are rewarded for being good and liked and praised within that cult and being in the inner circle. Outside of that cult, um, you are bullied, despised, and have no future. That's what a cult is. Jonathan Fletcher was very charismatic. He was a great teacher. He had a, a growing, dynamic church, was part of the evangelical movement in England, and he was, as we've learned through the a Telegraph story in this report and other documentation, untouchable. And that's where mistakes happen. We saw that with Ravi. We saw that with uh, all the uh, uh, televangelists of the 80s that, that went down in flames. We see that all the time, that there's a certain point where an individual, not even a bishop, becomes unaccountable. And for all intents and purposes, Jonathan Fletcher was unaccountable. So, George, let's give him a quick brief story because this does go back 40 years uh, to the, the Jonathan Fletcher uh, drama, so to speak. This actually goes back, I think, to the 1930s uh, before, before <laughs> Jonathan Fletcher was on the scene. Sure. Jonathan Fletcher didn't invent this. Jonathan Fletcher was the... Uh, the uh, well, I'll tell you what it. Um, Jonathan Lech is still alive, so uh, all these wases are ises. He is charismatic. He mm -hmm. is all these things that Kevin shared. He is successful. This is an issue of the perversion of Protestant evangelical theology from it, its roots in the 1930s. Uh, there sort of began a Protestant revival within the Church of England, and it took off really after the Second World War. You, know, you had people on one corner like C.S. Lewis, and then you had like John Stott, J.I. Packer. And in the 60s, you had the argument over whether we stay in the church or stay or leave the church. And Stott sort of led the forces to stay within the church, fight for reform and create our own parallel structures. And Stott being of an upper middle class background and having a very swanky parish in London and having been part of the Ewern camp or bash camps, which were camps for boys from public schools, which at the top uh, from the elite private boarding schools or public schools would be go to these summer camps, be formed into groups who had a sort of shared evangelical muscular Christian theology and worldview. We have some things like those in the United States, but they're nowhere similar in any way, shape, or form to the, to the intensity of the, the, and the power of these cliques. So Jonathan Fletcher, his father was a cabinet minister, uh, independently wealthy, unmarried man, uh, goes through the uh, system of uh, the bash camps of uh, the Cambridge and Oxford, you know, the right theological colleges, Ridley Hall, Wycliffe, and Oxford, Cambridge. And in the 70s, he starts hit taking off and he becomes the incumbent of Emmanuel Church Wimbledon, which is an independent chapel licensed by the Church of England. And there he had a very successful ministry from the outside, growing the parish, bringing in young men to be apprentices and interns, training them up in the evangelical ministry. Fletcher uh, was one of the founders of the Proclamation Trust, which was uh, one of the, uh, the evangelical uh, uh, ministry alliance. All the, all the 
It was said that Jonathan Fletcher had more power than any bishop in the Church of England because of his personality, his connections, his cash, and his intensity. I mean, you would, you know, be he would be your friend, and he was he was a very famous letter writer. In fact, that's one of the things people would say about him that he would all, he he was so such a good communicator. What's to not to like? This is wonderful. Here's something that attracts young men who are looking for a purpose in life, and he gives them the ministry. Isn't this wonderful? Yes, it is wonderful. But there was a creepy side. And the creepy side was revealed in detail in this report. We began reporting this year, two years ago? I think 2019. Three, yeah, th yeah, three. Our first report on this was at least two and a half years ago, yes. And the reports were that Fletcher engaged in behavior with these young men whom he would singled out for attention. That was really strange. And we asked for people to tell us about it. And we had, and we reported one incident where Fletcher took a young man boating and asked the man to, and they were swimming naked in the river, a good, clean, healthy male fun that turned sort of a little strange when Fletcher asked the young man to masturbate and then Fletcher masturbated in front of him or Fletcher would have men over you know these young men over and they would give he would have them give him mas nude massages and if they were bad he would spank them with a sneaker and these are just uh, creepy sexual harassment but in addition to this sort of bullying uh, uh, I mean the spirit he engaged in spiritual abuse. Uh, there was one story of a young man who became attracted to a woman, and basically Fletcher said, "You know, you can't. This woman is not of our class. There's, he, you have you have to love me, not this girl." And the public reasons were, well, she may be middle class, or upper middle class. She's not quite, you know, right. But the real reason was that Fletcher needed the man's affection and couldn't be diverted to a woman. Now, we had heard, these stories have been around for a long time. I heard I I uh, was warned off of Fletcher twenty years ago when I was a student in England. And anyway, I wouldn't be of interest because I was a foreigner and I was married. You were in the wrong caste system of education. Yeah, I was in the wrong caste. I was an American, and Americans don't fit into the English system. Yes. Uh, so, but still, I said, "Well, oh, maybe I should go visit this church." He said, "Oh, you'll like him, but don't you know? Just keep your distance." Well, this keep your distance. All these things finally came out, and a report was commissioned by the parish, Emmanuel Wimbledon, and it was released. Uh, today tuesday yeah, at least last good. night at, at yeah. nine o'clock eastern time and we were given an advanced copy of the report and it's devastating yeah. it's devastating uh 15 27 of fletcher's victims of abuse were interviewed 59 members current and former of wimbledon parish were interviewed to talk about Fletcher almost was a Jim Jones character, almost, almost a cult leader, uh, David Koresh. And he took evangelical theology into some sort of very perverse, uh, you know, if if you need to be cleansed of your sins, so I'm going to just beat you with a sneaker on your bare buttocks. Uh, Kevin, that's sick. No, um, and we've talked about this with other leaders at the urine camps as well. Um, this is not just isolated to Jonathan Fletcher. This was a, certainly a environment that uh, people like Jonathan Fletcher could take advantage of. And I, when we had uh, Gavin on the program, we used to talk about the caste education system within that exists within England still to this day. There's also this caste Gavin, system. Gavin with, was Gavin was exactly the sort of person who would, mm -hmm. who would, you know, he was the right background, the right schools, the right mm -hmm. all this and that. Gavin would be ideal to go into that world. Mm -hmm. 
Gavin, though, was a bit of a maverick, and uh, mm-hmm. then as now, and uh, <laughs> he, 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 fortunately, he kept clear of that. Mm-hmm. He kept clear of that. Yeah, but it's also the type of caste system that allows for something like this to propagate and to flurigate and, and to grow because you don't want to be part of the other caste. You have a great line to success for your entire evangelical preaching priest career if if you're within my inner circle. And here's how you maintain the inner circle. And you don't want to be in the outer circle. And the people who were in the, the, the document says, yeah, I wanted to be in the inner circle, even though I knew what was going on. I didn't want to step out of the inner circle because that is death to my career. That is death to my understanding that if evangelists to, to, to be frowned upon by Jonathan Fletcher was, I was outside the love and grace and bounds of my mentor. And that, you know, folks, is a cult. Yeah. And where, so we have the top level of Fletcher who did not cooperate with the, uh, the investigation but did speak to the Telegraph and gave one line, I'm deeply sorry for these things that happened 40 years ago. Uh, the Telegraph article, I recommend to you reading, it's been published today and it's on the other side of their paywall, so you can do it, view it for free today. In fact, I will put a link um, in the show notes on YouTube. But that's, that's the surface level. Uh, the deeper level was that the culture in which Fletcher thrived was a culture of bullying and obedience to the team. Uh, I was just following orders. Mm -hmm. It's it's another generation in another country's way of basically saying how the same thing happened. I was just going along because it was everybody else was going there. So that bullying of uh, you don't question, you follow the lead, you will, you close your eyes to the malfeasance of those on your tr- in your tribe had become, has, it is claimed, is endemic among this constituency within the Church of England. Independently of this, we've reported on uh, a woman named uh, Kate Andrea who has filed a, a complaint against leaders of the Church Society and the Bishop of Maidstone, Rod Thomas, for engaging in bullying and harassment against her husband, who is part of this tribe, if you will. He went off the reservation, and because of that, he was basically his... uh, They're trying to destroy his life and career. He he was kicked out of the cult, Um, and they destroyed him. And so... sounds like Scientology in some respects, uh, in the way, uh, in the social interact, not mm-hmm. the belief system, but the social interaction and the, uh, and the almost semi-deification of whoever the leader is. Mm-hmm. So the, well, Emmanuel Wimbledon, the church put out a statement today. Fletcher's been retired for almost 10 years, 2012, I believe he left. Emmanuel Wimbledon put out things saying, this is devastating. And we are so, we're appalled that this happened. We're so very sorry because Emmanuel Wimbledon is still a successful, thriving parish. And you've had new leaders arise who are now being tarred with the baggage of the Fletcher era. And they're saying, look, we're gonna do whatever it takes to clean house, to make sure that these uh, behaviors, these, pathologies are expunged from who we are as a parish the uh, the four in, the four independent reviewers in addition to their paper released through 31 8 which is the safeguarding agency they released a paper uh, they released a statement Susie leaf who was the husband of Dan leaf one of the members of this team uh, released a press statement which is actually more devastating than the hundred and hundred fifty plus page report It's only two, three pages, but it basically says the report and the uh, leaf paper basically say heads have to roll. We're not just talking about Jonathan Fletcher. We're talking about people who either through passivity or through 
fear or through whatever allowed this evil to continue to be manifested poisoning uh, the Christian faith um, it's interesting that uh, Rod Thomas the Bishop of Maidstone uh, doesn't appear in the, the report 318 reports some of the evangelical leaders who in recent years are, have been accused of sort of shielding Fletcher from a program. Their names don't appear in this report. Well, and it's because the report wasn't really asked to look at them, it was asked to look at Fletcher. But what is being implied here, and what you can take away from the, the leaf paper is, some people have to go, lose their jobs, uh, or step away from authority. Well, what we have not seen in the Telegraph article, any of the statements, or the re Jonathan Fletcher report is, you know, do you have a comment, Archbishop of Canterbury? What, what do you think of all this? Nobody is seeking any comment from the Church of England. This, to they have completely separated themselves from this, uh, so that they're not hurt by the news. And I think it's amazing to see that they're able to do that. And one, nobody cares what the Archbishop of Canterbury thinks. Yet, I, this is the only story I've seen in, in well, one of the many stories I've seen in recent weeks where somebody should have sought the you know comments of the the Church of England, a bishop, an archbishop. What do you think? In the nineties, uh, Justin Well, Justin Welby was part of this world. He's part. This of This was world. his world. He's he should of, have a comment. The, this is the fruits of his uh, of his. Uh, upbringing within the church church system this is his tribe um and he even lived uh in uh, the vicarage with uh, a man named rushton who was one of the evangelical leaders who initially was informed 20 plus years ago about jonathan smythe and you know here i am a foreigner in 1997 being warned off against these people by the chaplain at my college. Um, what did Welby know and when did he know it? Mm -hmm. And as you say, Kevin, the Telegraph couldn't be bothered to ask for the Archbishop of Canterbury's comments. It's either because they knew he wouldn't answer or because it just doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah, the, the office over there of the Sea of Canterbury has become irrelevant. And, and we've seen this happen over six, seven, eight years, that the press is less interested in what the church has to say, the Church of England, Anglican Communion, Roman Catholic Church. Your voice has slowly been squandered over time. Uh, a lot of it is your own fault. And this is a great and, and example this... of, you know, the, the Brits have a state church you were the archbishop of that church grew up in this time he would certainly have an opinion the telegraph well whatever there's there's an old does the office make the man or does the man make the office in other words jonathan fletcher had no national office but the man was so gifted in so many ways Please don't hear me to say that this was the monster. He wasn't a monster. He was a flawed human being who can be redeemed by the grace of God and will be redeemed if he repents. Uh, he had so many fantastic gifts and his, I think, motives were pure. It's just there was no accountability, no oversight. So this was a man who was successful. Justin Welby is a man in an office and the man has not made the office. He's detracted from the authority of the office by his, well, by his actions. Mm -hmm. Or inactions. Yeah. So now here you brought up redeemability. Is this redeemable? Of course this is redeemable. This is not critical race theory. This is Christianity. Okay where everything okay. can be redeemed through the blood of Christ. Sorry, yes? I, I would 
before we before we get to the good stuff. Okay, uh, he's more to talk thing. about. <laughs> God is Jesus is still Lord. We shall all be saved if we come to. I mean, before we get to the to the high note at the end of the song, uh-huh. the danger that Fletcher, uh, the, it. To, I don't want people to hear this as being solely an English problem of class and privilege. It's no. not. Okay. I could succumb to the same cult. Here I am. I have a successful parish. I see my bishop once every two, two and a half years. I have no oversight, practically speaking. I just turn in my forms. Everything is up. I pay my thing. Everything's fine. Pay your assessment. I have no practical oversight at all. And, you know, most bishops hate that parish is working. I don't need to get my nose in there because I don't want to mess it up. Were I put in the position of Fletcher and if I had the demons that he had, I could easily have, I could easily create a cult. Ministers can easily do this if they're not held accountable. Me, how am I held accountable? I'm held accountable by the wardens of my parish who are not just mere functionaries, but who act and function as elders of the church so that I'm accountable, I'm accountable to Kevin, I'm accountable to members, in other words, I'm, I hold, I allow myself not, how should I put this without seeming like a jackass? I know people, I am a fallen, broken human being who needs to be held accountable by his brothers and sisters in Christ. And when I make this lead, and so you can't question me because I have one of these, you have the Catholic priest scandal, you have the Jonathan Fletcher scandal, you have you know, all the abuses in the church. Each of us must be accountable to our brothers and sisters in Christ. (laughs) Now let's do the good stuff. (laughs) And and I need to echo that. Uh, Anglican TV Ministries is a uh, certainly an influential uh, news organization within uh, the Anglican world, certainly Christianity indeed as well. And we are accountable as well. Every time somebody has a complaint about what something we publish, we do talk about it and we uh, we try to address every complaint. Sometimes things get lost in the email process. Please understand if I'm using Gmail, that thread thing can get a little lost. I apologize for some. You know, I uh, somebody was really upset once because I didn't respond to an email in time. That's on me. But we we do really take you know what you as an audience and what you as the church and what you as people who we, we report on uh, uh, question and want to be sure that you know the stories are accurate and we we do too we don't want to put out anything inaccurate damaging uh, that cannot uh, be reflected well upon Anglican TV the Anglican Communion and the church as a whole this this news organization serves a purpose to glorify God not ourselves and when we fall short of that I have this I have a wonderful person on Facebook uh, who keeps me in the mend and accountable and uh, it's a wonderful person who used to be a missionary to Uganda will every once in a while say mm, you shouldn't have posted that and I'll what do you mean <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I, I'm accountable to obviously my my bishop and my uh, my priest and to the archbishop and stuff like that. But to do what we need to do at the level we need to do it, we have to be accountable um, because of the importance that you hear the correct information that um, is glorifying to God and that can be here we go redeemable. So George. In the history of mankind, I can't think of anything that could not be redeemed by the blood of Christ. This being another example. You are certainly a studier of history, church history, um, and I'm sure you'd agree with me. But this is, this is hard stuff. I did not wake up this morning looking forward to reporting on Jonathan Fletcher, talking about some of the, the shortfallings of the ACNA. That's not my goal in life, but I do know that news like this, because it's redeemable, helps people with their walk because they can see other people struggle and recover. They can see other people fall and say, I don't want to go there. What do I have to do not to be there myself? Because you are right. We all have those demons. We can all end up uh, in one way, shape, or form uh, a Jonathan Fletcher, a Rave, uh, another fallen person for money, 
for sex, for power, for authority, for you, you can count the sins um, for which we can fall. And I am a broken sinner, redeemed. This is redeemable. And, and this is why woke Christianity is a false Christianity. <laughs> Because there's no forgiveness in no. woke Christianity. It it singles out the group and makes them the devil. And there's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. Let me accuse you and shame you because of the color of your skin. And, and allow us to learn more about Christ through that. Well, that doesn't work for me, George. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you have been... Uh, affected by the Jonathan Fletcher scandal in any way, shape, or form, I do ask that you seek counsel, that you get counseling for it. I know that uh, it's been mentioned in all, all these documents that this is just the tip of the spear. There's certainly more than 27 documented victims out there. Uh, and um, please get help. Uh, and, you know. and what is so... One of the awful features of this is that there... I mean, I've, we've only been in contact with a small number we haven't been in touch with the 27 um i know one i can remember one well person blame still still blames himself yeah he 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 blames himself and well i guess it must have been i must i must i must have wanted to do this or i wouldn't have put up with it i must part of the part of the, the abuse cycle is to have the abused victim make themselves as much a villain as the victimizer. And this is, we, we saw this in the Fletcher case. Hmm. All right, George. Uh, hey, you available Friday? <laughs> cool. If so, we're not canceled. No, if we're not canceled, yeah. <laughs> if critical race theory hasn't got to us. So please, people, go to the comment sections. Um, I, give us your thoughts on the Jonathan Fletcher case, how we can avoid it, how we can hold ourselves and our church more accountable. Um, and you, kind of your thoughts on, you know, how the ACNA should respond to critical race theory and uh, maybe some more other bishops could be more prominent in, in dis at least discussing uh, this thing that is really taking over the secular parts here in America. It, it, to me, the most interesting part of critical race theory in wokeness is the French want nothing to do with it. That's how bad it is. <laughs> yeah, like you guys don't know, <laughs> and we have a gender for everything. Our tables have a gender, so you know. <sighs> it's crazy, George. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 654 of Anglican Unscripted.